Cortisol increases during aging, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got plasma levels of cortisol measured in the morning, plotted against age, with data from birth through 80 years old. And for both men and women, we can see that cortisol levels increase during aging. So why is cortisol's age-related increase important? Cushing syndrome, which is characterized by excessively high cortisol. In at least one study, it was 470 nanomoles per liter. And if you look at the data in the previous slide, on the previous slide, with the age-related increase for cortisol, it's possible to achieve levels as high as 470 nanomolar, which would be considered Cushing syndrome. Now, Cushing syndrome, which again is characterized by excessively high cortisol, negatively impacts many organ systems, which we'll see here. And I won't go through all of them, but there is some overlap with things that happen during aging and the clinical phenotype that goes along with excessively high cortisol in Cushing syndrome, including visceral obesity, an increase in visceral obesity, or in other words, an increase in visceral fat, osteoporosis, and heart disease. So these data suggest that the age-related increase for cortisol may have some similarities to the excessively high cortisol that's present in Cushing syndrome. On the other hand, cortisone declines during aging. So on the y-axis, we've got cortisone levels, plasma levels of cortisone plotted against age. And here we can see that cortisone levels peak in youth. Now, just as a quick side story, in baseball, for example, if a pitcher may have a sore arm from throwing the ball, they can often get a cortisone injection because cortisone can act as a local anti-inflammatory. So it may have anti-inflammatory roles systemically during aging. So cortisone levels peak in youth, and then they decline for both men and women during aging. So how does cortisone relate to cortisol? So if you saw the thumbnail to the video, then you know that cortisol is converted into cortisone. And that's what we'll see here. So on the left, we've got cortisol. And then in the presence of hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, cortisol is converted into cortisone. Now, as an important metabolite in this reaction is NAD. So NAD is required for conversion of cortisol into cortisone. So if NAD is low, conversion of cortisol into cortisone will be reduced. And as we all know, I'm sure, on this channel, NAD declines during aging, which then suggests is a high cortisol to cortisone ratio associated with low NAD. In other words, NAD is low, cortisol can't be converted into cortisone, and correspondingly, there's a high cortisol to cortisone ratio. So to find out, I've been using at-home metabolomics to track levels of cortisol and cortisone. Besides these two metabolites, it includes this kit, Iolo's kit, includes 600 plus others, many of which I've covered on the channel. And if you've missed those videos, it'll be in the right corner. To measure NAD uh, on the same day as testing metabolomics using Iolo's kit, I also sent blood to Ginfinity for NAD analysis. And if you're interested in measuring these metabolites on your own, there are discount links in the video's description. So what's my data? So first we're gonna take a look at the cortisol to cortisone ratio on the y-axis plotted against NAD over the first nine tests. And when looking at these data, we can see that there's a significant inverse correlation between the cortisol cortisone ratio with NAD. And you can see that the p-value is less than 0.05 and R is less than negative 0.7. So this is a, technically a strong correlation. In other words, Lower NAD through those first nine tests is indeed significantly correlated with a higher cortisol to cortisone ratio, exactly as predicted on the last slide based on the biochemistry. So with that in mind, if I increase NAD to greater than 30 micromolar, will cortisol, the cortisol to cortisone ratio further decline? So test number 10, that's the experiment that I did for test number 10. And those results just came in. That was for a February 4th test. Those results just came in. It, it takes about a month to get the results, which we can see here. Now, first we can see the NAD result of 48 micromolar. And to get there, I used 200 milligrams per day of nicotinic acid. And when looking at the trend line, we can see that there's still an inverse correlation between the cortisol to cortisone ratio with NAD. But when looking at the stats, we can see that the correlation now has significantly weakened such that the p-value is not significant anymore as it's greater than 0.05. And when looking at the correlation in terms of how it weakened, it basically got cut in half from negative 0.86 to negative 0.42. So does that mean that now low NAD or NAD is not significantly correlated 
with the cortisol to cortisone ratio in the totality through 10 tests, that is indeed what the conclusion would be. But note that we have one data point driving that correlation, which is the most recent test. To fully explore that question, I'll need to generate data for NAD levels in the 33 to 48 micromolar range, which I don't yet have. You see that there are no data points within that range. So for the next test, which is scheduled for March 18th, test number 11, I plan on once again sending blood for NAD analysis, metabolomics, in addition to all of the clinical chemistry biomarkers that I'm going to measure through venipuncture. And then we'll be able to see with at least one more data point how this correlation plays out. If you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers, I now have 29 biomarkers in a new Patreon tier. This is almost two hours of content in three videos for now, and I'm planning on building more videos into this tier over time. And so if you want to go beyond what's optimal based on the reference range, this may be the Patreon tier for you. And if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, I also post at least twice daily in each of these five Patreon tiers. And before you go, there's a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that go to help support the channel, including altalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, the clearly filtered water filter, which I use every day, at-home metabolomics, as mentioned in the video, oral microbiome composition, NED testing with Genfinity, also mentioned in the video, epigenetic testing, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes the DNA methylation test Grimage and ApoB, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.